<clears throat> so just in case you think I'm making it up or somebody else is making the science community is pushing this agenda that science is really important and, but no one else really cares. I just wanted to put up this uh, cover from Time Magazine from 2003. So this uh, edition comes out right around the time that the human genome is being published and it marks the 50th anniversary of the elucidation of the structure of DNA. And it's quite clear that the artists who had the task of of creating this cover uh, had in mind this dialogue between science and religion. So the importance of the discovery of DNA for our understanding of ourselves and for our health, but also the way in which this new knowledge helps to unfold for us a, a different understanding of some of our, our major, some of our foundational religious stories. So how do we understand our religious tradition in light of the new and wonderful things that science is offering? Okay, so uh, I, think I mentioned earlier that I'd like to look at a couple of different topics this evening, just basically as examples of the way in which this conversation has been changing quite a bit over the last few years. Um, because I think that's part of that dynamic. With the dialogue with science, it's never about something that's fixed and has been around all the time and we've got all of the issues all straight. It's about um, basic issues but which uh, new knowledge and new technology uh, is going to change the, uh, the, the character of the conversation. So I'd like to start then with the, the stem cell conversation and then move on to talk a little bit about the Human Genome Project, the impact of genetics and medicine, and this new idea of personal genomics. Okay, to begin with this, this stem cell idea, um, the excitement around the concepts of stem cells uh, is based on this idea that there are cells in our body that are constantly renewing. And we also know, have this other concept uh, that comes from biology about the way in which um, some, stem, some stem cells can give rise to a wide variety of different differentiated cell types. So you have a well, relatively nondescript cell that people will call a progenitor. It can make lots more of itself, but it can also differentiate into other cell types. And here on this diagram, um, which I borrowed from a uh, document on, from the National Institutes of Health in the States, um, it shows the stem cells differentiating into neurons and blood cells and muscle cells. So that's the idea. If we can learn about how stem cells work in the body, perhaps we can use them for repair of, say, nervous system trauma or repair of degenerative diseases. Um, whether it's something like muscular dystrophy or Parkinson's. So that's the idea of this regenerative medicine making use of stem cells uh, to renew a body that uh, has, has a degenerative problem. This idea about stem cells was around for a while, but it, it had a, a particular impetus in the 60s when people were trying to improve upon the blood transparent plant, the blood transfusion process. Um, a couple of uh, good scientists here in Toronto, uh, Till and McCullough, they were studying um, how blood cells, how, how blood stem cells were able to regenerate an immune system, so all of your white blood cells and your red blood cells, um, in the case of, say, cancer patients, or some of this work started um, people who were radiation victims and stuff. So this, the stem cell field really gets its start in this very basic uh, stem cell uh, therapy that we do so commonly, which is um, blood transfusion. And it's particularly important, obviously, in cases of cancer uh, treatment, where perhaps all of your cell, your um, 
blood cells are going to be wiped out. The conversation about stem cells uh, and related activities took a big bump in interest in 1997 with the cloning of Dolly the sheep. And uh, that brought up a whole series of issues around stem cells and cloning. Then the very next year after the cloning of Dolly, there was this article appeared in Science where a scientist, a group of scientists in Wisconsin, at University of Wisconsin, said, well, for a long time we've worked on stem cells, embryonic stem cells in mice. If we want to take this to a clinical position, we need to figure out how to work with human stem cells. And so they created human stem cell, embryonic stem cell lines that were derived from the uh, inner cell mass of, of a human embryo from a uh, in vitro fertilization clinic. So an embryo that was determined by the clinic to uh, be spare and therefore would be destroyed was used to create the first uh, set of human stem cell lines. Okay, so how does this stem cell business work? So with embryonic stem cells, the idea is that these cells here, which come from what is mentioned as the inner cell mass, these are the cells that will give rise to the embryo. This slide points out that while we start as one or a few cells, um, all of those cells in that original thing that's listed as a blastocyst, um, that's all you, we have to start with to give rise to us. And it more or less works all the time, that's why we're all here. Um, but you can take those cells that would normally give rise to the body, you can take them out, it destroys the embryo, put them in a dish, and have them differentiate into a whole variety of different cell types. They first learned this trick with tumor cells. They found that culturing certain kinds of tumor cells in culture, you can um, give them different growth conditions and they would differentiate into particular cell types. So this is the promise of stem cell therapy, to obtain um, early stem cell lines and be able to differentiate them in a direction you want, and then use them for transplantation for regenerative medicine. 